you want to, uh, I guess I can start off with, if you haven't already done the attendance and make sure we have a quorum. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, we have a quorum. Um, so uh, I will identify that we have uh, Justin, we have Deborah, we have Mark, we have Michael, and we have Andrew as uh, to meet our quorum, and we have Kyle, and we have Kayla as non-voting members. So we can call the meeting to order. I'm sorry, 14 minutes late, and uh, I'll turn it over to Kyle. All right, thank you very much. Um, and at the end of the meeting, we can set a yes co-chair. Yeah. Um, so I just want to pull up uh, on the agenda today. We've got two, I've got two items. Uh, first up, um, a, a final draft of the land use survey report with existing zoning summary uh, that came out as an email. I'll pull it up and share my screen right now. There we go. Okay. Uh, so not that many changes from the last iteration, the draft that we reviewed quickly the last two meetings, but yeah, I was able to sit down and get some more accurate numbers in terms of our partial counts. So um, in terms of not a huge amount of change, um, there's actually two fewer parcels than what was last reported in the master plan, and that's likely just from um, um, some zoning, some parcels have been combined um, over the past seven, eight years or so. Uh, it doesn't really change the percentages. Still, 59% of parcels are residential. 15% um, of the land use is farm or forest, with two thirds being in chapter 61, 61A. That's that 313 parcels right there. Um, in the chapter category. 8% is commercial industrial mixed use. What has changed is there have been 35 condos developed over the last eight years or so. Uh, so that's exciting, a little variety in your housing stock. Uh, in terms of vacant parcels, uh, a little less. So there has been some development. So currently 311 total vacant parcels. Majority of that is zoned residential. Uh, and a lot of it is actually determined undevelopable based on physical constraints. So that could be wetlands, that could be slopes, but I'm gonna guess most of it's wetlands around uh, in um, Hadley. And there's also, uh, what do we call it? Um... The protected agricultural land. So uh, Mike, what do we call the area? JPR. No, the ones that could have the spotted. So uh, there's a oh, there's a term oh, for that. It could be core habitat or. Uh, yeah. Yeah, something like that. For environment. whether they've been cited uh, there or not, there are mm -hmm. areas of town that are protected by. How, how many residential parcels are there? Uh, oh, total residential parcels, 17. Oh, okay. yeah. What was that, 276? That, that is residential out? that are uh, vacant. Okay, okay. Yeah. And yeah, a large portion of that is the undevelopable category. And Deb, did I respond to your email um, about the breakout? So in terms of zoning, zoning hasn't changed these past years. So this yeah. land... Um, I have uh, total acreage and such that hasn't changed. A um, uh, little summary of all of our zoning districts and overlays remains the same. I did insert because we discussed it last time. Um, I decided that we should put in the transfer development rights. So in section 17 of zoning bylaw, uh, the farm farmland preservation overlay district is established. And um, and within that uh, section of the zoning bylaw, there is a process for transfer of development rights. Um, it establishes a sending district and a receiving district. The sending district, all um, agricultural residential zone parcels are considered the sending district. Receiving district uh, are all parcels.
parcels either zone business or industrial. So it's essentially the areas that we're looking at when we look at the zoning map and the eastern uh, half of the Route 9 corridor. Uh, and here we just have a paragraph that kind of summarizes the process that's uh, a property holder or a developer would go through to utilize uh, transfer development rights. Um, there's, there's a formula, it, it breaks down to every acre of preserved farmland translates to either two housing units, two extra housing units, or an extra 2,000 square foot of commercial or reduction of, I think, up to a quarter of uh, minimum parking. So there's still a there's still a cap on uh, parking. You can't get rid of all your parking if you transfer that development to your receiving um, parcels. But um, essentially, it's just a mechanism to you know uh, preserve those farmlands and those uh, agricultural soils, uh, and then also encourage a little extra density in you know, the business and industrial zones. Um, so just wanted to add that um, clause just to help um, try to articulate it well last week, but uh, I'm still wrapping my head around it uh, personally. Um, I don't know the last time the planning board actually had to. Um, we took some money from somebody a couple of years ago, didn't we? Well, wow. we said you know, it's a it's a special they, permitting they, process. They right? didn't have enough parking, so we said, "Well, you got to give us." A, Twenty-five thousand dollars or something. Recall that. Was that was that the hotel? It might have been the hotel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I also have some information to share, but I don't have it with me. I think it's on my other phone. Okay. I had um, a good question from Deb um, in the week uh, between our last meeting and this oh. about how those real affordable units mm. uh, stand up. Compared to the getting, if you had twenty five percent, you can rec right. you, you can claim one hundred percent. And uh, I turned to he of all great knowledge, Bill Dwyer, hmm. and he and I had a few back and forth emails, and I've got that with it all broken out. Oh, and, okay. and then I said, "Is it okay for me to share this?" He said, "Oh yeah, public input, please share." So I will send that out to everyone. That'll be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, so in terms of the, the summary, um, nothing new after that section on the transfer of development rights. Uh, the appendices, which I did email out. Um, uh, starts off with the zoning map and then gets into all of these um, bylaws. So you have that. Um, that was the 53 pages. Right? Yeah, they're pretty extensive. So uh, at your leisure, feel free to read through. Um, uh, but there's a nice little summary of all three completed in, this, in the survey report. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing so that we can transition. I'm sorry, the summary of the bylaws yes. in the initial the beginning of the report. There's a summary at the bottom at the bottom of the report, the last two pages. It's the end of the report. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, and then you find a full bylaw in the mm -hmm. appendix. Uh, and those three bylaws are the PDPC's mixed use development, the PDPC's infill development, and then the EOHLC's smart growth zoning or the 40R bylaw. So that's the that's the zoning language that uh, the planning board would want to stick to as closely as possible if that's the recommendation of the steering committee to explore a 40 yard district. Um, so it's good to get familiarized with that. Okay. Um, so any questions about that document that's deliverable or do we want to proceed to conversation about um, a draft survey? Kyle, I'll be honest, I, I can't get a good sense of it from sure. 
on this preview. I mean, yeah. you did a great job, but yeah. I just need more time to take it in. Can we, right. will yeah. we have a chance to discuss it? Absolutely. At the next Yeah, we can always come back to it. You gotta run for planning board. Yeah. What's that? You gotta run for planning board. Why? Because you'll pick up all the lingo. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's not the lingo, it's just the, the, the you know, detailed report. And then yeah. you have to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh yeah. So switching to the next point on the agenda. Uh last week we talked, we talked about the broader uh strategy for engagement. Uh, we're gonna take a three-stepped approach. Um, then we're going to start off with uh, an online survey over the summer months to try to start getting some interest uh, and a little bit of insight to the residents. Uh, and hopefully that feedback will inform what will become the broader public engagement. Um, I did consult with my colleagues uh, and PDPC in the past has done a little insert in the uh, water bill to try to get uh, a little yeah. bit more. I got the game. thumbs up on that. You got the thumbs up. Yeah. So then I think when it comes time, if we just know what um, what the time frame is, uh, we can create, you know, just a, a, a third of a letter piece of paper, a little insert. We'll make sure that we get them all trimmed up. It'll have a little blurb. And a QR code, and people can take it on their phone and advice. Just do that one. Did we, uh, and we talked about this last week, did we get any information on how we can reach non homeowner residents? Mm -hmm. the, the water bill is right. the easiest, but it, it misses an entire demographic. Yeah. Uh, I did not explore that strategy. Oh, there's a to find some. I don't know if we have any options with the local post office or you know, if there's a some sort of arrangement we can do it maybe if there's a budget within the town that we could use from town hall to distribute mailers or uh, I, I do think that's a really critical oversight if we don't reach out to the people who aren't homeowners we're not going to get the perspective of all residents right you get perspectives of uh, developers too because we, you can go all through through all these iterations you want to, but if it's not economic to develop these things, then nothing's gonna happen. To it was it Westfield? They did a 40 year four or five years ago. Uh, they did nothing's a long, happened. A long time ago. So nothing's happened. Yeah, it's, it's and we don't want to do something and nothing is gonna happen. So I don't know why nothing's happened, but certainly there's gonna be a reason. I would think one of them is economic. Uh yeah, it's a good it's a good question. I live in Westfield and I know that area and I don't know why that area was ever deemed a 40 R district. But uh, in terms of engaging with developers and getting that voice um, heard, I think that's a good idea for our focus groups to make sure that if not at one, if at many of them, we can have a developer or someone with some experience in developing real estate, bringing projects to completion. I think it's important for I do that. Didn't Wells Westfield get a chunk of cash for putting? Yeah, this? they. I think their district. They only anticipated. I think it's in like the one hundred unit range. So it's not. It's not yeah. like they got a max yeah. and they can get the six hundred thousand. No, what's the maximum? I think it's only two hundred thousand. Um, so they still got you know they got the money. They still got fifty thousand dollars from the yeah. state. Um, just don't want to go down that route. Right, yeah. Um, and yeah, to my knowledge, I don't believe any, they haven't developed anything within the district. I don't know if anything has happened since they founded it or formed the district. If something else came in and it just wasn't, um, it wasn't affordable housing. Uh, there's a popular brewery restaurant that's there. So it's it's an interesting case study. Yeah. But, um, <clears throat> but looking at the survey, um, I've got some, all right, this is going to be a little complicated. I'm going to share my screen here, um, but I'm actually, I've got survey monthly pulled up, so I just need to move some things. I, okay. Uh, so, okay. So, um, 
those of us that are in the room, we're looking at a printed copy. Um, of this draft survey. Um, and a little bit of a introduction, try to just get people introduced to the project and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, <clears throat> wanted to try to keep it simple in terms of questions. Um, I didn't add any demographic questions in there. We can bring up some quick ones, um, but um, Opening with an, uh, um, the most open-ended question, I thought would just try to get people, you know, giving some something um, uh, of their own, and just kind of starting off with a, a blank canvas. Uh, question number two: Creating a smart growth district invites the potential for greater residential development. Um, which impacts are you interested in learning more about? So. This relates to, we had a quick conversation last week about kind of myth busting. What are the topics that uh, we may anticipate needing some more information uh, to help educate and inform the public? So I put in a couple that kind of pop out. We discussed uh, school enrollment, infrastructure, and uh, taxes. So just thought this might be a good way to uh, get a sense of where residents are um, and what information we may want to include in the educational element of a bigger event uh, in the late summer, early fall. Um, so talking a little bit about um, you know, what adding, adding housing could do to school enrollment, what it could mean for your infrastructure demands like water and sewer, how it could impact traffic or road conditions, taxes, um, of course, housing, um, and then of course, parking as you know, we're looking at um, possibly redeveloping residential areas, or I'm sorry, commercial areas that already have a lot of parking, but um, changing that over to residential, you know, what are the parking needs? Could we add uh, sure. services like Fire police. I think that one has come up a few times. Sure. That's why I pulled this up right here so I can start adding stuff. Okay. Also, while you do that, um, just for the sake of correcting the record, last week I had stated that I think I said 60% of our tax revenue comes from commercial businesses. And I realized I had that figure reversed. It's 30 something percent, 33%. So just correcting the record that the statement I made last week. The, the figure was flipped. All right, so 33% of Hadley's revenue comes from residential property. I don't know if it's exactly 33, it's roughly a third. Yeah. Roughly. Okay. Commercial. Oh. A third from commercial. Right. And two thirds from residential. pretty significant. That's what I thought. It's supposed yeah. to Amherst. Like, right, yeah. it, is, it is a lot compared to other uh, of, of our regional partners. Right. Um, it's a higher percentage. But I think that that was the reason tax isn't on that list is there's, I think, a misunderstanding about how our tax revenue is generated mm -hmm. with commercial businesses. So, Mike, I, I don't know if you were on the Zoom or not, but we had talked about our local options taxes being meals, hotels, and cannabis, and everything else in the commercial district, we receive tax revenue through property valuations. Right. And that, I think that piece of the education was missing. So that's why that's on the list. Mm -hmm. All right. And then public services. I think that's... Right. A fine addition, um, and we can talk about that. Um, I a little feedback on the first page when yeah. I first picked this up. By nature, I jumped right to the first question, and then realized that it's assuming a certain understanding. So then I went back and read the information of your first paragraph, right? Because I'm like, oh, how do the how does John Q. Public know what a smart group district is right um and then when i went back and read that i'm not sure it seems to jive with what i thought you said last week and i thought last week i said oh it's probably a long route nine because it has to have pdta you said well it doesn't necessarily so it could be elsewhere but in here it mentions business and industrial or is that just referring to the mixed use you know it's 
In here, it's what the second paragraph where it's yeah. uh, part of the second sentence so, uh, to explore creating zoning amendments to allow for mixed use development in the business and industrials along Route 9. Right. And then it says it also called Smart Grip emphasizes redeveloping parcels and repurposing buildings. So that next sentence could be off route nine because uh, it's not really if i'm trying to fill out the survey that might cause me more questions okay that's fair um i think uh based on the initiation of the project from the planning board um the route nine corridor is the focus uh, and I think particularly the east side where there is no overlay existing. It's just the industrial business zones. Um, I can clean that paragraph up a little bit. Well, I guess clarify. if you could clarify for me, did I mishear or misread? Did you say last week that it, it wouldn't have to be along Route 9? Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, it doesn't have to, have to be include. along the bus route. Nine. That was um, that's one of the, if I remember, it's one of the avenues for application. But yeah, we can cool. also use the previously developed or infill development requirement. Right. Yeah. yeah. So um, when it comes to the forty uh, R path, forty R requires there. There are three categories that 40R is deemed appropriate. The first is transit oriented, and that's where a transit station or terminal is required. Which we don't have. Uh, which, while we have plenty of routes and PDGA route stops, um, there wouldn't be any feature in Hadley that would qualify for transit oriented. So then you would fall to your area of concentrated development. That's what they call the, the next category. And that would be all of your industrial zone, your business zone, um, because it's already zoned to allow for commerce. It meets a requirement that 50% is zoned for a mix of use. Okay. So you would meet that category mm -hmm. requirement. So 40R, you would still want to focus mostly on the east side of town along Route 9. Um, and just to be clear, we're excluding the west side of town because of the um, village overlay, um, the historic village overlay. Or that's the floodplain through. That's up to you. Yeah, the floodplain impacts a little bit. Um, you have the village center overlay with senior housing. Um, I personally uh, would avoid. Um, Approaching on those because you already have two uh, symmetrical you know, overlays upon overlays. Um, for the sake of um, offering amending language or something like new, um, I think looking through the inside of town is a little bit more okay. um, appropriate, yeah. applicable. Uh, but you're the steering committee. If you want to allow for people to think about it all along Route 9, fair game. I think that's fine. Um, I think there's, you know, you have a distinct kind of shift in the feel of Route 9. Once you get to a certain point, like it, it changes a lot. And it's, I think it's that threshold of really we're kind of on the cusp right here. Right, where it changes from village center to business industrial all the way to the end of town. Um, so it's it's up to the committee if you want to kind of leave it wide open as we're looking across Route 9 or if you want to just focus on one side. It just seems like we're asking people to, to live in a lousy part of town <laughs> aesthetically. Currently, well, currently yeah, right? Yeah. 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 And that's why we, the the rest of the questions are trying to get at because um, 
yeah, like you're <laughs> you're not going to want to just put in a bunch of tent row houses or condos, yeah. duplexes, and parking lots with this stro what we would call strodes in the profession. You know, these wide right of ways with multiple lanes. Um, and box stores, right? That's not necessarily appealing uh, as it is, but there are ways to mitigate that and bring designs. And that's, you know, the promise of 40R is to say, you've got to set design standards so that it's aesthetic and it's appealing to live in. But which comes down to economics. I mean, it might be better off just to blow up the Hampshire Mall and start again. I mean, seriously. Yeah. Well, if you've got seven million, you can buy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's a fraction of seven. Well, is that an option? <laughs> is that an option for the town to buy them all? No, no. It it just sold for seven. I know. And, um, okay. That was from the creditors. And so then there's no tax revenue. They're the just town owns it. Yeah. Play. Well, and then sells it. Huh? And then sells it. I, I don't think the town. Won. I think the town's. Got enough uh, real estate that it doesn't know what to do with Russell School. Uh, it does. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which it, Russell School is mentioned as part of a redevelopment strategy. So that's something that we, we can so bring up at some point. This term in, ge in general, the term smart growth. Right. What? Is that tied to the 40R proposal or is it more general? So we cover in all three of the or two. Yes, I think. Yeah. Um, it is a broader concept. 40R as um, legislation is called the Smart Growth Zoning Act. So it falls under the it, Smart Growth umbrella. It's Smart Growth is a big umbrella that's international. This Commonwealth has taken it and said it applies to this legislation for uh, encouraging mixed use and affordable housing development. Okay. Excuse me. So, I guess I feel like this needs to be like a cover letter. This <laughs> this needs to be, in my mind, sure. it needs to be expanded. It's just not, I mean, it's just not clear enough what the heck we're talking about and why, you know. Can I not, make a suggestion maybe? Why we're, pro sure, just one sec though. And why we're proposing it. And it seems to me we need to say, you know, look, this, one past, you know, we're looking at this because um, there's a need for more housing in town. There's a need for more different kinds of housing in town. Right. And, and we also have concerns about, you know, energy and efficiency and climate. So that's why we're looking at a, this more smart growth model. You know, the state is in is saying the same thing. One possibility is that we get this 40 armor. And it doesn't have to be huge and long, but I think a few paragraphs to really just let people know what what <clears throat> why we're proposing this and where it kind of fits in. And then I think we should decide as a committee about whether to keep, you know, to propose this as, you know, there are various places in town that would be appropriate, and there are many that are not. Here are the ones that could be appropriate. Maybe that would be one of the questions on the survey. Okay. Um, I feel like this is just a little bit too far downstream, you know, like, and, and I, would, I wouldn't know how to approach it as a resident when right. I just got this right. in the mail. Right. Like I would, like I felt about the Chilton's fix your car manual. It assumed a certain understanding that I didn't have and I just threw it out. <laughs> First, remove the engine. You know, this, this starts with a certain expectation of... Yeah. Of understanding, which I think you're right, we need to boil that down to maybe some bullet points that help educate someone coming into this. Otherwise, if they don't understand the questions, our answers aren't going to be that informative, I don't think. Right. Yeah, I would suggest to that end, because um, I completely agree, we should probably start with. Um, I don't want to say putting guardrails on it, but maybe start by just zeroing in on what we're trying to address so that this first sentence, you know, planning board is convened, smart growth committee. I would also say, you know, among the town's top land use priorities are preserving agricultural land and open space. And to that end, that, you know, we recognize a need for more housing and identified 
Route 9 as a possible candidate to maintain the priority of not developing agricultural land. And if we can start, if we can frame it first that way, it shows, you know, we're thinking critically about land use practices. This isn't a catch-all for building whatever we want anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then I would suggest, rather than having one long paragraph, after that intro, maybe just do like a almost definition style. What is mixed use? What is smart growth? And that, I think, gives everybody the context. What is the town trying to accomplish? What do these terms mean? And then here's some questions to help us inform the conversation. We'll want to make sure that we have a shared understanding of what smart growth is. Well, I think that's where the QR code is very handy because mm -hmm. you can have a small insert in the mailing and that takes them where they can get all that information. Yeah. That we're not paying to print out three pages of well, you know, if we have let's say it's not that extensive, maybe just one page. Mm -hmm. It could act as an educational piece of educational material, even for people who decide I'm not going to fill out the survey, because a lot of people don't fill out the survey. Mm -hmm. But if they even if they just read one page, we've sort of begun the educational process. In any case, and then if they want to go, people who do want to well, respond and, and get more detail could go into the I think the links where I said three or four pages. I'm thinking it's a one page survey with if you're not understanding or you want to read more here, the resources would be those other pages so they can opt out of that. If they feel like they understand the question or they don't care to understand the question, they just want to express against this or for that, then they're going to do that anyway. Yeah. You know, the only way this is going to come to fruition is if town vote meeting votes for it. Yeah, and if you look at the people that attend town meeting, it's probably the same 95% or so every town meeting. Right. You're not going to get other people to show up. <clears throat> Those are the people you got to talk to. I don't, that's just the way it is. It's a, I, think town, I think town meeting is, I'd say... Frankly, just to, because people don't come and then right. they bitch yeah. about why did you do this? Well, you had to come and vote, you know? I mean, yeah. You're hitting on right. one of my big pet peeves, which is I think we have an engagement problem. Oh, I don't think it's that big. people don't want to vote. Truthfully, I missed the last town meeting because I had no idea it was scheduled. And I, you know, I didn't drive by Hopkins, so I didn't see it on the no. sign. I don't look at the town calendar every day. Right. I just missed it. And I realized after the fact, I was like, well, there goes my chance. You know, people sometimes, oddly, maybe not oddly, don't want other people in town to see how they vote. It's, it's, I know one guy's dead. Poor old John Karish wouldn't come to town meeting because he had Karish Oil Company, and he didn't want people to see how they voted. He was a prestigious member of the community. Mm -hmm. so, you know, you, the the, uh, the uh, annual report was dedicated to him two years ago, I think. I think, I think there's know. pros and cons to town meeting for yeah. sure, but yeah. the more that we can, you know, get information out and education, I think this is the kind of issue that would attract people to participate however they can, including town meetings. Sometimes you get a, sometimes you do get a crowd if it's an issue that's really important to people. I wonder if uh, it's maybe stretching our limits here, but if at the end of the survey we have a question that just says. Would you like to receive more information when it's available and you can plug in your email address and then mm -hmm. when we have a town meeting that touches on these issues we can blast that email list and now maybe would, get now would you be willing to come to town meeting and vote on this type of issue great yeah, yeah. exactly yeah uh so i provided a about seven questions to start off with. Um, I think a few of them are going to be a bit too much for now. Um, can we look through those real quick and just decide which ones we want to touch? Um, on, on the third question, number three, yeah, do we want to use the language lockable? Um, that's a good question. Maybe like more pedestrian friendly. Sure. Uh, yeah. what, what's the point? I don't understand the question. Using the using the term walkable. What what says the, what's the, it's more yeah. walkable, or do you want to say it's more pedestrian friendly? What's the question? 
What's the concern about walkable? It's a little ableist. Oh, 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 okay. I didn't understand. Walk well, pedestrian friendly, friendly, accessible. Yeah, the that's an alternative. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I want to. No, oh, um, you kind of you something we think is I would take Smart Road District out of that question. Just leave it about you know what would you like to see along with nine? Is sure. whether we go with forty R or not? We can implement these as zoning amendments no matter what. Yeah, yeah. I see uh, another thing to consider is that you know the rec um, the task for you as a steering committee is to offer recommendations to the planning board. Your recommendations could be you know very strategic, pointed amendments and just changes to the bylaw as it is without a big addition. Um, so if it's more helpful to just ask kind of generic questions, I'm happy to you know, pull the smart growth element out just to get a sense of you know, what are the amenities and the features that are missing in parts of town that- um, yeah. That might be a really good idea because yeah. we can always use that information right. for a district. Yeah. Right. And it has been many years since the master plan, right? The master plan was what, 2017, I believe. Yeah. So, you know. And I wonder if there's a, a meta question that relates to that. Like, you know, what do you see as the important ways to develop Route 9? Make it more pedestrian friendly, mm -hmm. have more green space along that area. You know, it, yeah. sort of pick out the things that you, you're addressing, but you know, give people a, a bigger picture at the beginning. Well, the, the bylaw requires it to be some green space on every parcel that's developed. It may not be attractive, but there's green space there. Uh, you know, it's up to the developer that's going to redevelop these things if, in fact, it's economic to do it, to make it attractive or people aren't going to want to live there. Well, right. the design standards would allow us some true, some amount of control. Like we could <clears throat> dictate a 12 foot buffer zone that includes five foot green planted area between the sidewalk and the street. And, you know, we, we can specify certain design oh, requirements yeah. that right. would be reasonable accommodations for a developer to make. Right. And remember, we've got parking requirements too, two for one. We've got 100 feet of building, you need 200 square feet of parking. I think 40R would require us to reduce that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Would it? Yeah. Okay. Because it's looking to increase density. Yeah. Yeah. So parking is, gets reduced substantially. Um, I don't know. I can't think of the numbers off the top of my head. But yeah, that's that's the big one. And that's, I think, probably uh, a tough sell, maybe, for some folks. But um it aligns with just the broader impulse of you know density requires a compact development parking lots and parking spaces tend to spread things out and create kind of islands of development um, well, there's a flip side to acknowledge too right if we if we don't densify route nine you know the area that's currently underutilized Growth is going to spill out into the farmlands and into the open space. It's you know that it has. We're, we're we're trying to prevent that, and that might come at a cost of you know the generous two to one parking that you know Sears used to have back in the day, but right. generally we don't need nowadays. Yeah. This was forty yard developed pretty much with Eastern Mass in mind. I think so. Rob, I mean, yeah, you know, it seems to be that most legislation is, has Eastern Mass in mind. So it's, sometimes it just doesn't fit. Yeah. Um, but okay, so back to our questions. Um, I think number two was good. Generally, we added uh, public services. Um, we can change some language for the third one. I wanted to ask the group um, on several of these questions. You're being very generous and say select all that apply. I wonder if we might get a little more sense of direction and prioritization if we said, you know, what are your top three concerns or whatever. Took it right off my paper. Did I? Yeah. All right, I'm a cheater. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think your like order of priority. I think you can set. Right. I think it gets hard to report out the results, and I don't know. You you've seen how that worked in the housing production plan, but. Yeah. Um, it's hard to glean what that means. Or like one person cards, puts like, this as one, and then the other person puts it as three, and it balances. And right, but if you just have like the, the top three, you can say which 
which categories got the most attention, right? Which, you know, right. which categories were in the most people's mm -hmm. lists, or you could, yes, you could, you could aggregate them and average it, or you could also say these were the top three getters for first for top priority. These were the mm -hmm. next. These are the top three for second priority. You know, that might be that gets tricky because otherwise you. Thirds and first balance out to so all second. Yeah, right. I don't Maybe know. we let the Survey Monkey Pro figure out how to yeah how to weight the responses. But yeah. I think the goal is prioritiz prioritization of the items so that we know which are the highest on the list. Okay. Um, yeah. 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 I was I was thinking we maybe if we have seven or eight, maybe we they rank them right one to eight, which I think is helpful. Uh, of the questions that are here. Only one that I think is rankable. I don't think I've made any that were rankable, right? Multiple choice. Multiple choice. So the way it works in SurveyMonkey, if you wanted to do a ranking or a prioritization, it's it's like a drag feature. So you just start moving them. Here for, it's a but an arrow button you can also do. So you just hit up and start shifting things. Hmm. Um, on on a print, we would just make a special instruction. You know, please number the your, box your top preference one. Work down. Right. Um, so just just kind of the behind the scenes of that. Um, I don't know one through eight for this kind of thing. I think that's hard to. Yeah, I, I think it's hard to do. I I think people have to think it through a little better. Yeah, yeah. whether it's just their top several. I, maybe I'm yeah. Gonna, that, yeah, that, no, that, no, yeah, I'm I'm just devil's advocate that someone's going to feel uncomfortable by leaving something off the list. Like it's not like they don't care. They're just. Yeah, but I guess if we say top priorities, not like mm -hmm. we could also just instead of click all the reply, we could change it to um, strongly agree, you know, yeah. don't 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 really care, and strongly disagree, or uh, what our wording is. Yeah. Is there a particular question that we think we'd like to change that format? What are green amenities? Green amenities. Uh, so this would be. Is uh, this about green ideology? This whole thing, uh, Kyle. No, no. This one's more. This one's more uh, open space related, but uh, kind of um, uh, green space, and greenways, that kind of thing. That uh, thank you. Uh, so for this question, it's, it's a lot of uh, just nature based amenities. Um, Tree trees, greenways, rail trail, uh, community garden, pocket parks, um, planted medians, very green alleyway. Right. No, I wasn't, I wasn't pushing an agenda of any kind. Uh, is number four sufficient the way it is? Uh, would you be open to redevelopment of Hampshire Mall to a mix of business and more diverse dense housing? I think uh, yes, the word dense yeah. is inherently negative. I would just strike more diverse, comma, dense and just say a mix of business and housing. Oh. Um, and I'd also suggest a part two to that question where maybe we ask what types of businesses you'd be most uh, uh, I don't know, excited to see on Route 9. And this came out of the UMass student project, actually, where they did a survey of the businesses and their, their use case or how many people visited them. And it was the lifestyle brands like Planet Fitness and Trader Joe's that had the, the by far the most volume. Right. And Trader Joe's probably even had like twice the volume of traffic that Target does in a quarter of the footprint. It's right. Pretty interesting. So maybe it's like, you know, lifestyle and fitness, you know, retail, I don't know, whatever kinds of business, the restaurants, bars, breweries, if we enlist yeah. a bunch that we can get some input. And, and the whole reason this approach makes sense in many ways is that the cost of the land isn't going up and we have to put more housing on less land. I prefer going up. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't mind seeing a five-story couple five-story buildings along route drive. Well, that's question five, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, 
that's what we're trying to get at. Yeah, it's it, the pictures are moving. Well, I'm, I'm not others. talking high this way, <laughs> but you're right. I think the more density, the better. But yeah, I mean, you know, as you get to medium you get density, it, that's the only way to cut the cost. You know, the, the cost of a uh, building lot mm -hmm. is going to be a uh, twenty-five to thirty percent of a house. And we, you know, we talk about the oh, the options taxes, meals being one of them. A restaurant or bar would do significantly better on Route Nine if there was an apartment building right above. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um. This might do sense. I'll show up. I was in there last week. I'll tell you where I was. I was cutting to my tomato plants. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Uh, so number five, I think, does that kind of, that? I think here too, uh, the highest level of density, maybe we change that to um, uh, what is the most appropriate scale of development? Land or, efficient, land efficient, land use efficient. Does the average person, I agree with getting rid of the level of density mm -hmm. part. Um, what? Or what kind, what about this? What kinds of buildings feel most appropriate? That's a good way to put it. For, yeah. for this kind of district along Route 9. Okay. And can, can you spell out whatever ADU is? I can do that too. Yeah. Accessory dwelling unit. Yeah. Uh, I've got a running list of definitions. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Kyle, on number five, that mixed use buildings one. Yep. Maybe we can find a, a photo to swap out for one of these that just shows something with more than two stories. Yeah, a little bit bigger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are we asking people to pick one of these? This is a one of, yeah, this is a select your favorite. Well, what if everybody picks low intensity just because it's most familiar? Does that mean there's no, I mean, do we want to set ourselves up for a situation where they're saying we just don't want mixed use buildings? I mean, I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to make it easy for people to just say. Yeah, I mean, that's a little bit of a loaded question because I like that you asked what's the highest level of density. But maybe that should be clarified, like in the, I mean, because if they're picturing that as infill in the historic district, although I think we're, we're kind of not leaning towards the east, we're leaning towards the, I mean, towards the west. So you have nothing to compare it to density. What, yeah. is, what is, what are we comparing it to? We don't know. You know how many people okay. live per square mile? The, the hotels, yeah. well, hotels are three floors, yeah, and everything else is one to two, yeah. If we strike single family version on this question, because so, yeah, it's, it's, it's just not, it's yeah. not realistic, no matter yeah. what response we get. Mm -hmm. Would it help to make this one where people rank them so that they're all in there, but you get a sense of ranking? I think it's a lot easier to rank three than seven or eight. Exactly. That's what so I'm thinking too. I, right. I think if we're going to rank something, this is a better question to mm -hmm. format that way. And then if it if the rankings mm -hmm. go down according to density, at least they're not off the they don't have to be off the thing just say right. this is so keeping these three but uh, changing some of the images just to diversify um, yeah i'm just thinking that you know devil's advocate that people's responses could vary if they're thinking closer to east street versus closer yeah. to north and south maple north and south maple mm -hmm. oh maybe a four or five story would be okay there but, yeah. but not so much Right next to the uh, you know bank ESB or the post office, it yeah. would be out of. So part of this committee's right. purview, if I am understanding this correctly, is to make the recommendation to the planning board both for 
how to move forward, but then also potentially what the boundary of a potential mm -hmm. district might be. And can we just define that now? And I mean, I think we all are kind of saying the same thing that mm -hmm. the east side of town is really not appropriate for the, for the is, scale of the development we're talking about. So we could just zero it in and say basically everything west of everything town is, center, or uh, sorry, east of town center. Yeah. I'd want to think about that more. Yeah. And so that's what we found working with our other community that's doing a very similar task is they're very um, hesitant to um, prescribe the boundary. Um, but we did give them some alternatives to start thinking about just to help them frame questions and engage with the public and at least get them thinking about what is what really does feel like a district, what feels like a neighborhood, and what's a bit too expansive. Does that community have the majority of the community with town sewer? Uh, that one, the where we're looking at, that one, it's, it's easy. Yeah, we're looking at like a downtown area. Yeah, so it's all, it's all got all the infrastructure. It's major, one of the major issues here. Yeah. Does the infrastructure much. differ a lot east and west on Route 9? Yeah. Sewer. Town sewer goes this way. It doesn't, it goes to North Hadley along Route 47, but it doesn't go out this way. Uh, everything in uh, Meadowbrook up, up in, uh, what is it called up there? Highland Circle? Residential. That, that's all, that's all something. Yeah. So this is one of the reasons it has to go here because you need town sewer to come in with this. Yeah, with with the amount of yeah, if you're wanting to really add housing density, yeah, density, you need some. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite follow. If you want to add it along Route Nine, does yeah. part of it have sewer access and part doesn't? All of Route Nine has town sewer. Okay. It's when you go that way that you don't. Okay, have that's town what I thought sewer, you were. Or that way when you don't have. But sewer. the question of whether we want to focus on east or west on Route Nine isn't. That's not a sewer question. No. Okay, no. that's um so question five will keep with some minor revisions. Um maybe mixed use could look cuter. It looks pretty awful in these. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, I'm sorry. These are, these no, are, no, these no, are no, these that's not images we had laying around. No, no, but it, they could be really cute and I think it might affect the people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> No, we, uh, when we use this image in another community, um, immediately people saw brick buildings. Yeah, like, I mean, I that's not totally fit. fit. You're like, okay, all right. And mm -hmm. immediately no to the idea because it doesn't look right. Uh, so, yes, we'll do our best to mm -hmm. find good images. If you need help, Kyle, I can. I have my, plenty of photos professionally that I can share. That, that might be helpful. I'll let you know, be in touch. Um, uh, just to get through these questions, just to see if six and seven still work, or if we want to revise these. Um, number six, as we explore more pedestrian-friendly um, district, um, what transit enhancements would you prioritize? So this was a select all, but we could simplify it. Um, and really, the, you could almost tease this one apart, because there's there's really transit, and then there's some that are more, uh, yeah, this one's a tough one. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and also we have this new, uh, I forget what the state calls it, but it's like a dual use sidewalk that's coming, but it hasn't landed yet. It's right. gonna be here by like, I don't know, is it gonna be done by the end of this year or is it next year? Is it is it along which along, side? Of it's along Route 9. Um, is it on the south side? I think it's primarily on the south side, but there may be sections that have both. Yeah. So what does dual the, use mean? Uh, means it's not just a four foot sidewalk. Mm -hmm. it, it's got width so that you can bike and walk. Right. Yeah. Because that's the issue that you know people you don't want people biking to the mall on the shoulder of Right. And there aren't enough access points to the and they're actually doing Real it through spines yeah. off, you know, Route Nine, like where Route Nine, you know, Route Nine is either north or south of uh, of the 
rail trail and they're they're um as i understand i think they're they're doing sidewalks That's to right. get you from the rail trail yeah. to that um yeah okay I feel like it's what I mean. I, I like this question, but all the all of the answers seem important. Yeah. I don't know if we if there are other options we can throw on here just to juxtapose. Okay, you know, I, I don't know. It, it seems fine as it is, but I also look at some like if you ask me to prioritize, I'd say these are all important. Mm. Why do we have rail trail connections if we've got bicycle lines with roads pass going down Route Nine? Why is that important? The rail trails more the walking people, I think. Well, I think a lot of people. I've people. almost got flipped a couple of times by bicycles taking a walk up around my dog. Well, I I see like you know people going to Amherst from Northampton biking in the morning and on the rail trail in the evening. Yeah, I take my bike on it to go shopping sometimes. But why would you use that if you can go down Route Nine with a bike? I think it's. Well, safe. I think the idea. Safe. The it's safe. It's like it's, it's like safer. arteries versus yeah. you know side roads, right? So the the bike path would be an artery, and then you could hop off and get onto the sidewalk to get to the business. But, oh, well, but the point is, the rail trail is safer than riding your bicycle down Route Nine, no matter how many white lines you put between the bike path and that. I think it's dangerous. But it's also like a parkway. It has less. In, in, in interaction, and you yeah. call that safer, they would also think of it as more efficient. There's less interactions, and then you hop off where you want. Whereas if you took the sidewalk, you have driveways and whatever that you have to cross. And yeah, I and mean, you can call it safety, you can call it comfort, ease. And will people be riding their bicycles down Route 9 February, say, 10th, when we've got a blizzard and it's Zero degrees outside. Will there be any rail bike traffic coming down here tonight? You know, under those types of conditions. I think in a storm there won't, but I think after it's plowed, you'll see people. I mean, I, I'm seeing a lot more bike. I mean, we're far from Amsterdam, but we're I'm seeing an increase. I think yeah. as we see more e-bikes uh, become adopted and popular, it's uh, yeah, it's very likely. I I mean. On my commute on Route 20 from Westfield to uh, Springfield this winter, early spring, I was seeing a lot of folks still. In the winter time? Yeah, March. I was seeing them in March. You know, fully, you know, rubber suits, but and getting, you know, all kinds of muck sprayed on them, but they're making an effort. I was out there in January. I mean, granted, it was like 55 Bogota. degrees, but there were a couple of things, right? <laughs> My wife's from Bogota, Colombia, and yeah, you know, they don't have the winters in the app here, but it gets cold, and they're, they got those bike, those electric bike things all over the place there. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, pretty, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty cool invention. I'm not going to lie. This is, very, this is very minor, but. Minor, yeah, that's fine. To ensure smooth and safe traffic flow. It, it confused me when I got there because I think it's all about pedestrians and bikes. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering about um, maybe just putting travel in there or. Um, yeah. It's my hand. I guess we could add some stuff for like car centric speed limits, speed bumps. So we wouldn't want any of those on Route 9, but. Right. I'm thinking out loud that there might be some others that we can layer on here. Yeah, they put them on North Lane over there. Well, people are speeding down there. Those seems to work pretty good. I hate those. Right. We have eight on one street on campus. Oh, so, yeah. But we've had students get hit in the crosswalk. So now you got to, I call them the, the seven sisters. Yeah. I have to, to get from work. Out to the end. So, so. I don't recall people being hit by automobiles as much as they have in the last, say, five, six years. It's just cell phones. Cell phones. That's right. Yeah, cell phones, you're right. Yeah. Cell phones. See, it's not even cell phones. Like it's screens in your console. And you have 11 inches of screen right yeah. there in front of you. It's 
I think that's pretty distracting. I think that the mafiosi guy that was decapitated in New York two days ago was on his iPhone. Did you see that? I don't think I saw that. No. I I he was semi-retired. He's 87, but he was a couple. And he didn't look up. Wow. Bam. Scary. Uh, last Checking question to look at right now. Checking his Instagram. No. <laughs> yeah. So item six, are we going to try and do that in rank format? Because as Jim said, it, they really all are interest. And are we going to get any informative right. feedback if everyone just checks all? Right, I would check all of them. <laughs> okay. You know, so what kind of parades? Uh, that's just a generic concept. Let's just throw it out there. I don't know. The non-biased kind. Of yeah, whatever Whatever that side of town likes to do. Um, um, uh, if this one, I mean, this was, this was a bit more focused um, and uh, really like trying to create that type of um, it's like place making, you know, turning it into something like a neighborhood or a, a a distinct yeah. kind of Remember, area. this is Route 9, and the town has no say over what goes on on Route 9. True. Um, so if this one is not appropriate right now, happy to cut it. Um, we can hold on to it for later. Seven? Yeah, number seven. I like that question. I mean, whether or not we do it on Route 9, I think it's an important data point. You know, what is our community value? And we, we just talked about how there's no, you know, very little engagement with town politics, but how can we encourage more social engagement amongst residents? You know, I wonder if that would be a good one for if you're doing it. I don't know the meta question of mm -hmm. you know what would what are some of the values that are most important to you in a smart district? We're, we're not calling it that, but in a new district. Well, in the and, future of Hadley, let's just you know, broad brush it. Yeah, right. and then uh, um, and that could be one of the choices in that meta question is social engagement and opportunities to gather as a community. Mm -hmm. A number of people have, have commented about the um, the little festival that goes on in West Street. It happened a month or so ago. Asparagus festival. Yeah, I caught that once, and then there was a year after there was a cider festival that was done there. Yeah. And people would go on the bike path and talk to me. And I didn't know that was happening. And I said, Yeah, I didn't either until I saw the lawn sign. So it, it's a, it's actually people like those kinds of events, but yeah. I don't think we advertise or facilitate them enough. So this might actually get to some of the the meat of what people would like. That's a good point. Yeah. There's a car show with the Hadley and Men's Club every month and once a week in the summertime. Mm. Not my cup of tea, but people like it. Really? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. they're popular in Westfield. I think there's already been two, maybe three this year. No, I think they do the they shut down Elm Street. They shut down Coles Main Street. I didn't know we had. And somebody wants to put a they're putting a new chicken place in Hadley. What it's called? What is it called? Hot, hot chicken. Hot, hot Mike's. Hot Mike's hot yeah. chicken. Hot David. And they want an outdoor dining, Thanks. but they can't have it because there's not going to be enough parking. Oh. Okay. So that's just these are some of the things you run up against. We could have it's a, a variance chicken. application. For transfer of developer rights. Yeah. Out there during performance, there was a big festival with the young men's club again Saturday. Saturday night. And you could feel the we could feel the bass guitar in our in our house. Well, that's a good half a mile away. <laughs> Something to think about. Uh okay, so um good feedback on these. Uh some revisions. Um I'm hearing uh, a lot more introduction if this is our first really engagement with the residents. Uh, more um, context, some definitions. Um, uh, I think we might be trimming a couple of these just to make them a bit um, a little bit quicker to work through. Um, uh, possibly adding a follow-up to Number four, what types of business would be attractive or appealing? Um, yeah. So, um, in terms of timing, um, we could get this ready to review for the 15th, and it can go live online 
as soon as we're happy with it, I can have a link ready to share. Um, so we can get it to someone in town to post on the town website, at least get it out that way. And you said that the uh, Survey Monkey supports some kind of IP identification, so you can't stop the box. Or? Uh, we can we can open up with a we'll open up with a logic a question that's you know like, are you a resident? Mm -hmm. um, and that can kick people out quickly, and they won't be able to come back in. Yeah, we can play with that. Although M Michael was also mentioning. Engaging developers, but that might be a we'll separate stage. Yeah. But you know, we don't have developers that would be willing to, to tackle something like this. That this is mm. pointless, yeah. right? They may not now, but that's just. I mean, the construction climate is True. In, insane, and the cost of building. It's so just the way the performers work is the rent has to be high enough to justify the investment. Exactly. And usually, with most of the developers I work with, there's some form of equity partnership. So there's a certain demand of return, and you have to lease up to 90% within a certain amount of time. It is a complicated equation, but I think part of the benefit of engaging with developers would be in crafting the design standards if we went to the 4 r because that's where I found that a lot of the hiccups can occur is if you start to mandate buffer zones and height restrictions and step backs per story and and you put all these requirements in there. That's, exactly. That's where the costs start to add up. So the right. developers would start to shy away. Yeah. And I think that's, you're both getting at a, a good point of the, the challenge of crafting regulation and bylaw um, is um, you're trying to show developers that the community is at least open for development, right? Um, and I think engaging with them at this point, talking to them about you know those standards that are um, you know an impediment, you know breaking those down, seeing what you can actually let go of and what is um, non-negotiable, uh, at least shows you know once we get a recommendation from the planning board and things materialize that Hadley is open to. A particular kind of development that fits with the community, but at least it is, you know, appealing. You know, well, in reaching out to developers, I would hope that we would also reach out to nonprofit developers like oh. CDC. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know who? I mean, I think that's um, whose priorities would be different, but still um, very knowledgeable I think, absolutely. about what would be possible. Absolutely. Um, yeah, there's several several um, valleys. Valley CDC. Right. Um, PDCC, is it? PDC. Um, whatever happened with the Econo Lodge? And they got the goat from the state to, to go. Not yeah. Sure what, what, but nothing's ever happened. But now they have to get their funding, is what I think I heard. I thought they had that. Oh. They had it, but then that was based on the initial. I don't know if that has to change because of the. The process that they went through. I don't know. That's how this whole 40 hour start thing started with right. them coming before the planning board and they said 40 hours. So 40 hour, what's 40 hour? And that's where yeah. the learning curve began. Yeah. But you're right, rents have not begun to catch up with the cost of construction yet. And I think that's one of the big problems. In, in this area in particular. Yeah. That's why you see a lot of the smaller pocket developments like. You know, the stuff that Barry Roberts is doing, not small, but um, it's not the 300, 400 unit developments that you see nationally. Mm -hmm. Although, I, I, Mike, yeah. you weren't here last week, but we did talk about through this recommendation, we can also suggest the formation of like a design review board mm -hmm. such that, you know, every project within that zone would go before a board and be reviewed for design integrity and compliance with the standards. And like, there are ways to work some of those requirements into the uh, entitlements process. Well, you and Kyle are the architects, right? Are you an architect? I'm an architect. Yeah, so are you, are you a? I'm an island. Mark. Mark. I'm an architect. Mark, yes. Okay. Okay. Mark, you're a, a planner. I'm a planner. A little bit of landscape design experience, but yeah. I'm a planner. Um, 
In terms of uh, engagement strategy and everything, uh, just to wrap up the conversation, uh, I think we can have uh, a nearly final version to review uh, before our next meeting, which will have to be Monday the 15th, um, as I'm away the next two Mondays. Um, and I should be able to get that to you all before the 15th, so you'll have a good chance to look at it. Um, and if we can finalize it live on Monday afternoon, we can have a link ready to go that night. Just so is Ken right. Comey no longer working? Well, he's, he's still involved? Yeah, he, yeah. Okay. yeah, he's still deputy director. Okay. He, he, just, he got promoted busy. above us. He got busy, <laughs> and that's why they, they gave, gave more work to me. Uh, happy, happy to be in Hadley, though. Um, I think the, we for the 15th, we'll probably want to start identifying at least concretely some of our focus groups uh, and some of our co contact folks. So um, I would welcome suggestions, residents that you think need to be in conversations, stakeholders that you're aware of. If we know the Econolage folks, you don't want to talk to them, that's up to you all. Um, and we'll develop some kind of prompts, just a handful for those focus groups, but really they're kind of open in our conversation. The state's budget seems to be pretty in dire strait given the billion dollars going to migrants. So I think you're going to see less and less funds available on the public side to do this kind of stuff. So you've got to get the private people to want to bite at it. And that's just my opinion, but I think that's the facts. We're a billion dollars in the hole. Yeah. It's not going to change. <clears throat> the state is, from what I hear, starting to crack down on communities who aren't providing meaningful strides towards housing diversity and housing stock. There was, I forget the community in Eastern Wellesley. Wales, but... No, no. Um, I want to say it was Millbury or something. I don't know. It's probably wrong. But there was a there was a community that had to comply with a transit oriented development standard or something, and it right. got voted down at town meeting. And the state basically said, "Well, we're going to take away your funding." And all oh, that was Milton. 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 Yeah. Milton. Yeah. That sounds right. Well, I think that I think that's being challenged in court. Uh, yeah. I, I, what I can say is, I know the state recognizes housing as a, a dire need at the moment, and Right. Yeah, everybody says not here, but if not here, where? And if everybody says not here, there's nowhere. So I think we all recognize the potential on Route 9. And the question is, you know, what is right for Hadley? And that's where I think these engagement sections as well. Yeah. Did we settle the question of how possible ways to reach renters uh, from that no, earlier conversation? We didn't in this meeting, but I will um, I'll bring it back to my house. Unless they're on the voting rolls, you're not going to reach them. You know, yeah, and it's hard. I know we had some read some students in a house in North Alley that I grew up in. I tried to encourage them to register to vote, but they wouldn't do it. Well, and if, if they're registered, is there a way to know who's a renter and who isn't? Or you got to read between the lines, right? Uh, you, you know, you got you got you can get a list from uh, if they're registered to vote, but they don't own property. Yeah. Yeah, you can kind of probably work. Right. Well, at, at a minimum, we can put the survey in the library, oh, yeah. in, in, in senior center. We can put it at Hopkins. We can, I mean, we, we can put it out in places where you know families will be and yeah. people will cross. But I do think, I, I really think just outside of this committee, it's really important for us to figure out a way as a town to engage with that cohort. And if, if it's they're not on the voter rolls, then we don't have a choice. So be it, but I feel like there's got to be another way. And as a town, we, we really need to prioritize that. Yeah, you've got to get people involved. I mean, I've got two nephews that live in town. Both of them have two children in the school system. And the parents are professionals. One's a nurse. She's actually the nurse in the Halley school system. Got father is a what do they call it when you're not a doctor but you're close? PA. Yeah. They won't come to town meeting, you know. Mother's club, perhaps, or PTA, but not to town meeting. And that's where the decisions of the town are made is made. 
I made. I don't know how to get around it. We used to have, it used to happen on Saturdays. And now it's usually 7 to 10 at night or 7 to 9 at night. Not the worst problem. But, yeah. yeah, short of uh, allowing non present voting. Uh, I don't think there's a, or another form of government maybe it might yeah. be a solution, but. Yeah. yeah, I don't think we're quite a town Zoom meeting yet. No, I mean, it'd be, honestly it'd be great if we could go to uh, town hall and put a ballot box for town meeting agenda items, but everything has to be done in person with our local form of governance. Oh, um, I guess it's worked so far, but. That's not Kyle's problem. Given the, given the fact that you know this I can't, is where, I can't given the fact that you know this is where it is right now, I'm not I'm not sure that way is going to be working much longer. <laughs> um, so uh, your agenda next me next meeting would be Monday the seventeenth. The fifteenth. I'm sorry, fifteenth. Thank you. I combined the month and the day. Fifteenth um, at five o'clock. And. That's all we've got on the, today's agenda. I know I have a deck for that day. Um, it's, it, Mark, do you want to entertain a, a vote for a, uh, a vice chair? In case do we have any nominations? I nominate Andrew Gennady. Yeah, I was going to say someone who has better time, you know, who's better punctuality and attendance than I would be a good person to be. So, I think there needs to be a second. Or a second? To make a vote. Yeah. I'll second. Yeah. Both any, nominations are closed. Any other, or shall we? Does Andrew accept the nomination? Ah, uh, yeah, I do. Okay. Great. It's going to look great on your resume. <laughs> <laughs> He's the smart, smart vice. Um, lacking any other discussion, I would go to a roll call vote. Now, this is for vice chairman. This is for vice, vice chairman. Chair. Because earlier we said co chairman, we should have said vice chairman. So, so Mark, Mark, if you're not available, then it would move to Andrew. Is that correct? Right. Right. Okay. Are you okay with vice chair versus co chair? I am. Okay. <laughs> All right. So then we will go to a vote. Justin. Hi. You're in favor. Aye. Deb's in favor. I'm in favor. Says, yeah, I... You're in favor, so that is uh, unanimous. Thank you for Thank stepping up that way. Oh, right. And once we're offline, I'll share my phone number. Okay. Yeah, great. <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, I would entertain if we have nothing. Anything else? And anyone? Uh, before we... Quickly on the outreach piece, uh, I texted Molly Keegan about this, but I realized. You two might have more information. The affordable housing fund that we have, could we use that to purchase mailers to get out to the addresses rather than the water bill? I think you'd have to bring that up in front of the, uh, the uh, trustees on the trust, but I think we're probably in favor of that. <laughs> it's, yeah, and Bill, one of the trustees, and so is he. Bill could tell us, but yeah, I would think that, that would be, be so. Yeah. That, that would seem to be in line. Well, it's. I mean, the whole yeah. purpose is to promote yeah. more housing, so it yeah. seems uh, okay. So maybe we can run that down, and by the fifteenth, we can figure out if that's yeah. the appropriate yeah. path. This about what three or four hundred thousand dollars in there. When's the next trust meeting? Like I know they they meet quarterly, right? At a planning board meeting. Yes, but I suppose we could informally, we could put it on the agenda that we would meet and, and answer. Yeah, we could just put it on question. the agenda next Tuesday. Yeah. Or following Tuesday, whichever it is, yeah. Not tomorrow, the following Tuesday, whatever the first, the second. second yeah, it, July 2nd. It would be next Tuesday, yeah. <laughs> Um, how much would that be? We don't know. Can we say up to a thousand dollars? Yeah, you'd want to, it'd be postcard mailer. I don't know what they're running now, but per address, per physical address. Two thousand. Well, we just got to put a cap on it. Yeah, you might, it might. So, how many residential addresses 
parcels did you say we have? Residential, there were two, there were 17 something, 1787, 1787. So say, so like 1,800. Maybe three, three per dollar. Yeah, three per dollar. Oh, it's up to $1,500. Yeah. This isn't for the survey, right? What were you thinking? Of? Uh, yeah, to mail out the survey to addresses rather than attached to water bills. I mean, we could do oh, both. Okay. There's no reason yeah. we couldn't do both, but uh, so that this postcard would have the QR code. Right. right. I like that. Uh, <clears throat> let me know if we need to design and make a little postcard. Put the uh, QR code on. Um, happy to make a flyer when it's ready and that can get distributed around town, library, post office, the like. Um, you know. We have sort of a branding name now since we don't want to lead with smart growth necessarily. I, no, I, I'm looking at you, but I know it's the future of Headley. It's more the future. <laughs> Yeah. Gotta make the stakes feel high, you know. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, let me know if there's branding or phrases to avoid for sure. So happy to oblige. Okay. Well, with that, I know it was just supposed to be an hour long meeting and we routinely yeah. go over, but uh, so shall we motion to adjourn. Yes, yeah, so I would entertain. Would we have a second? Is that a motion? I will motion to adjourn. A second. I will second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.